CCTV. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jessica Yamas, and I started this series because of how immigrants are being portrayed in the media. I want to give them a voice, a proper chance to tell their side of the story and give our community a glimpse of what being an immigrant truly means. Having experienced firsthand how much of a struggle it can be to uproot your life and establish a new and better one in the United States has taught me that immigrants work extremely hard and come to the United States to better their lives and their children's. With this series on ECTV, we are going to listen to the stories of various immigrants from all over the world. Our first guest is Dr. Gabino Aguirre, an immigrant from Mexico who happens to be one of our community leaders. Hello, my name is Claire Verviegas, and today we are here with Dr. Gabino, and he will be talking about his story of being an immigrant. Hello, thank you for coming. Thank you. Yes, it's Glad nice to, to be have here. You. Yes, okay. So you were born in Mexico, correct? Yes, I was. Um, why did your family decide to come immigrate to America? Well, you know, the, uh, I think that there's this, uh, some people call it a myth about, you know, the, the American dream. Mm -hmm. In Mexico, it's called El Norte, right? You yes. know, the, where you go. And um, what, uh, what was going, what was happening with my family, the way that it happens with all immigrant families was, that it was getting very difficult for us to survive at that point for my mom and dad. It was very difficult for them to provide for the family and uh, you know my dad had just lost a job as a miner uh, in the gold mines in Parral, Chihuahua so uh, decided that uh, they, they would try for a better life in the United States. So from Parral, Chihuahua which is about maybe 400 miles south of the U.S. border Mm -hmm. They traveled up north and they got to Ciudad Juarez, which is right on the border uh, with uh, the United States and across the river from El Paso. And, and I was born there in Ciudad mm -hmm. Juarez. Yeah. But, uh, but the motive for my parents coming is similar to every other uh, immigrant family, which is to uh, try to develop uh, circumstances for your family to live happier and healthier lives. So, yes. Yeah. Most so. definitely. Mm -hmm. So um, you said earlier that you came to America once, but then went back. Um, what's what's the story behind that? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, like like lots of immigrants, uh, when you come to the United States, sometimes you come without uh, proper documentation. Mm -hmm. So uh, so my family, uh, after I was born, my father found a job across the border in El Paso. First, he was a bracero. Mm -hmm. And then as a bracero, he got to know some folks, uh, some ranchers that lived on this side of the border. And one of them liked him and uh, decided that, uh, that he was going to give him a job. So, um, so one day, we lived on this ranch. And uh, because we, our family was in Juarez, most of our family was in Juarez, we were in El Paso, then uh, we, would, we would live on this side Monday, Friday, and then Friday afternoon till Sunday night, we would be across the border in Juarez. So mm -hmm. it was like living in the best of two worlds, so to speak. But anyway, uh, so one day we come back from, it was Sunday night, we come back from Juarez and we get to the ranch where we are, uh, we were living, and everybody was gone. And you saw some children running around and they were crying. You saw some parents, uh, some men and women that were running around. It turned out that the uh, immigration authorities had come and raided that ranch and, and indiscriminately taken everybody who was there. Uh, some, uh, so the children were looking for their parents. Their mm -hmm. parents were looking for their children and not knowing what had happened. So at that moment, my father decided that that was not going to happen to his family. We went, we drove, we turned around, drove right back into Juarez, and then we lived there for a couple of years while uh, my father, with this rancher who he had met, sponsored him to, uh, to obtain uh, legal documentation for the rest of the family. So uh, I remember the first day that we, uh, that we came into the United States, we came across on a flatbed truck. <laughs> and uh, I remember jumping off of that truck and landing on uh, a little 
plant that's called bullheads. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I landed on there, and and I was barefoot at that time. So <laughs> my first my first experience in this country, so to speak, was uh, a painful experience. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, at that moment, you know, thinking back on that event, I knew that it was going to be a difficult life. Mm -hmm. you know? So. So anyway, um, so uh, so we, we immigrated to this country and uh, started school. And uh, at that time, there were seven of us in the family. Eventually, developed into a family of twelve plus two parents. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, so we were farm workers. My father was a farm worker. We lived on a farm, and my older siblings became farm workers themselves. And being fifth in the family, then I myself had to, uh, from the age of, you know, four or five years old, uh, work in the fields picking cotton, and mm -hmm. and then later on, uh, you know, learn how to drive a tractor. And, yeah. you know, so, but it was uh, it was a tough life, and uh, you know, we were barely making it. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Wow. So twelve of you is a lot, huh? Yeah. 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 Um, um, I was wondering, you said that you eventually worked in the farms with your father, mm -hmm. um, and now you are extremely successful. So what, what steps did you take from, from there till now? What education did you have to go and get? Yeah, well, uh, uh, the, uh, the education system in Texas at that time was very rigorous. Mm -hmm. So, and even though m we didn't know English when we started school, we had to learn it right away. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this is quite a while back, I mean, you know. Uh, so, uh, so we would watch television and listen to the radio and picked up English that way. But, mm -hmm. but anyway, eventually uh, made it through elementary school. And then uh, I was, I was part of three members of my family who started high school at the same time. You know? awesome. And uh, so uh, halfway through, my sister died, halfway through. She was two years older than I was. So they left my brother, uh, who was four, four years older than myself, going to high school. And uh, it, by the end of the year, he had dropped out. So I hung with it, and uh, I found school to be pretty easy. And I was a hard worker, so uh, so it was easy for me uh, to uh, to be liked by my teachers. Yeah. And uh, as you probably know, as a high school student, that when your teacher likes you, things get better. Yes. <laughs> and when you need help, mm -hmm. they're there, right? Yeah. Versus a student who is oppositional and antagonizes his mm -hmm. teacher. Sometimes they don't get the same support that yeah. you know. So. So anyway, I made it through high school, and eventually, uh, even though I graduated from high school with honors, uh, nobody ever talked to me about going to college because as farm workers and, and in the world of immigrants, sometimes your horizons are very limited, yeah. and you can't see what's on the other side of that hill. So as far as college was concerned, that was, that was not part of my thinking. So, uh, so I graduated from high school, and the very next day, picked up a hoe and started chopping cotton as, a, as an honor student. And uh, by the end of that summer, I realized that, uh, that I could not stay with my family because, one, we were always hungry. And secondly, I was just a, another mouth to feed. You know? mm -hmm. So when I was, I graduated from high school when I was 15, so I left home, came to California on my own, and then uh, got into uh, business college. Wow. And while I was in business college, I wanted to be a bookkeeper, and because my parents had always said that that was the way to go, so <laughs> not knowing anything else, I decided to be a bookkeeper. And by the end of the first year in business college, I realized that, that was not, I was not cut out for that. It was just <laughs> not what I wanted to do. And uh, so, uh, so very soon thereafter, I got that knock on the door that you know, during that time, young men in the United States were getting that same knock. And it was to, uh, that the service wanted you. You know, yeah. you were being drafted into the Army. This is during the Vietnam War. So I went into the service. And uh, by the end of my, uh, my stint in the US Army, I realized that 
uh, that our involvement in, uh, in Vietnam was actually an invasion of that country by the United States, became very alienated and uh, decided that, uh, that I was either going to go AWOL, which was yes. to desert mm -hmm. from the Army. So, uh, but before I went AWOL, before I decided to do that, I, uh, I went and talked to a priest that lived, uh, that was stationed at a mission very close to the military reservation where I was, and I asked if I could live there with them. And uh, it was just like a Ventura mission. Yeah. It was one of those missions. Uh -huh. So I went and talked to the priest, and I said, I'm either going to desert or something, so uh, I'm asking for asylum here at the church. And he said, well, I don't, we've never done this. It's highly unusual. Mm. So uh, I'll take it up with my superior. So the next day they said, yeah. Wow. So the last few months of my stint in the army, I lived in this mission. <laughs> and, uh, and while I was there at that mission, then uh, one of my friends had gotten out of, out of the service before he was due to get out. So when he called me and told me that he was getting out, I said, but you still have three months to go. And he said, well, if you sign up for college, you can get out mm -hmm. an early out, what's called an early out, up to 90 days early. So I said, where do I sign up? Ah. And he says, any junior college, right? <laughs> any college. So I signed up and, and I got out uh, early, three months early. So I went to junior college and by the end of that first semester, got straight A's, I always liked school. Wow. And my counselor goes to me, went, came to me and said, you know, you don't belong here. You belong at a university. And I said, how do I get there? And he yeah. says, let me help you with the paperwork. So by the very following year, I was at UCSB wow. and at a university. And then from there, uh, for a couple of years, having been already in, in the service, I was a, a little bit older than everybody else. And um, so, uh, so like all, not all, but most incoming college students, you're confused between your emphasis on socialization mm -hmm. versus academics. And uh, so I got into both, more on the socialization side. Okay. And uh, eventually after a year, after two years at UCSB, I realized that I was not working to my full potential. Part of that had to do with partying. Part of that had to do with uh, my involvement in the Chicano movement and the student movement at that time, which was parallel with the civil rights movement mm -hmm. in, the, in the 60s and 70s. So uh, I went to UCLA and finished there. Wow. Got a degree from UCLA and then uh, became a teacher and then went and got a credential for counseling and became a counselor and then went and got a credential for a principal, administrative credential, became a principal, <laughs> and uh, in the meantime got a master's from USC and then decided to go back to UCLA uh, to get a PhD and I got a PhD. So, wow. Mm -hmm. So you so. just never stopped? No, actually when you add up all the years that I've been in school, it's almost about, it's, it's a lot like 25 years of school. My family's like the that. same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some, mm -hmm. it, it's school and education is something that I've always found exciting. And, yeah. you know, learning is just part of, you know, what I consider to be the human condition. It's you important, know? too. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. What so. do you think, um, do you think you have been <clears throat> given opportunities that you took advantage of being an American citizen that you, with your education, that you probably wouldn't have gotten? if you stayed in Mexico? Well, you know, it's, uh, the thing about Mexico is that it's an impoverished country. Mm -hmm. Even though not as impoverished as other parts of Central America and South America, still there are great economic challenges and the, uh, the gap between the rich and poor is much greater in Mexico than here. You know? yeah. so, so the fact that, I'm, that, that, that the United States provided some opportunities that perhaps did not exist in Mexico is true. Yeah. It's true. And uh, so, uh, so you know, n it, those cl those doors are not always open. Yeah. Uh, I credit the civil rights movement as be and the Chicano movement as being uh, the 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 uh, the uh, the conditions 
uh, the political conditions that opened the door for a bunch of us who heretofore would not have been able to go to college. Yeah. They opened those doors wide with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and 65, and a bunch of us kind of like, we almost kind of like got through before mm -hmm. that door closed. Yeah. Very soon after we got through, that door closed again, so mm -hmm. now uh, those, uh, those doors uh, have come up again and uh, some of it has to do with the cost of education, which yeah. is ridiculous right now. Absolutely. You know, so, mm -hmm. so um, I know that there's a lot um, going on in, in recent um, politics right now with the Caribbean and um, just all of that that we've been hearing in the news. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on that? And why do you think that some people view immigrants as a threat or um, or what do you think like influences their opinion on what an immigrant might be and what they might bring to America? Well, uh, on the on the first part of the question, which was you know how do you feel about the caravan mm -hmm. that's yeah. you know that was hyped up recently with the recent elections, national yeah. elections, what do I think about that caravan? Well, I see that caravan as being part of you know what has happened for thousands and thousands of years where. Uh, individuals who group together in some form of some kind of a society uh, or community uh, when when their living conditions become untenable then uh, they look for a better place to go yeah. and uh, human migration has been part of uh, the history of humanity forever so uh, so that caravan is similar to folks that are political refugees and war refugees coming out of Syria out of Yemen out of those countries. And uh, so it's not much different from that. You know? uh, the fact that, uh, that this country historically has welcomed uh, immigrants into this country, as stated by, you know, on the, on the Statue of Liberty, then, uh, you know, other countries have had that also, that kind of welcoming, but the United States had been exemplary in accepting immigrants up until now. Yes. And uh, most recently, the issue of immigration uh, has been politicized to the point where uh, you, it becomes very divisive, where it's us and then there's the other. You know, in sociology and, and political sociology, especially anthropology as well, you have that notion of the other. The other is that person who is not you. That other is the person who does not uh, live in your community. That other is that person that that doesn't look like you, that doesn't yeah. speak like you, that doesn't have the same, uh, eat the same foods, that, that's the other, right? So, uh, so in, uh, politicians have found it uh, useful to uh, politicize the other in that form. So recently when we heard uh, the president, I call him number 45, you know, when you hear the president talk about this invasion that's coming in from Central America and mm -hmm. Mexico and how he's going to get the military to defend the country against this invasion, you know. I mean, what kind of, a, what kind of an invasion would it be if, uh, if, if those invaders had no weapons, had little to no money, mm -hmm. had no power whatsoever, all they wanted was a more comfortable and safer place to live. So, uh, so anyway, uh, you know, to 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 kind of continue to answer that question, uh, the caravan and that migration that uh, that is happening coming toward the border is just uh, it's just a normal process of the human condition, and it unfortunately it's politicized to a point where a, 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 a significant portion of the United States buy that buy into that line and their uh, tendencies toward racism racism and discrimination kind of play out you know so you talk about welfare babies you talk about welfare mothers you talk about uh, about people that come in just to have their baby so that they can become American citizens you talk about folks that are coming here and taking jobs from, mm -hmm. you, you know, all of that. Uh, that's just part of the political, the politicization of the, of, 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 immig of immigrants and yeah. their community. So, so uh, I, I understand that, you know, the open borders in this time where you have nation states 
uh, like we have currently, that uh, that open borders is not probably practical or workable at that time, although it's something to think about. But uh, but certainly there are laws, international and national, that uh, that guide us toward how to treat folks who come to the country to uh, seeking asylum and uh, those laws are on the books and you know I think we should as a law-abiding country that we should follow the laws in uh, how we accept and how we treat immigrants that come to our door. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yes. So. I know you're very involved in your community and um, you're a very very powerful activist. Um, I just wanted to to bring up that subject because I know that you were Santa Paula's. Was it? You're the. Were you the governor for a while, right? Well, uh, some people call me the governor. Some call me the Jedi. But you know, <laughs> actually, I was the mayor. Mayor. Uh, the mayor. Yes. Of Santa Paula. I was. Uh, yeah, I was elected to city council. Uh, not because I wanted to get into city council, mm -hmm. and as I mentioned to uh, some candidates at a forum recently, uh, we don't go into uh, into politics. Uh, most of us, some of us, let's say, we don't go into politics because we want to. We go into politics because it's a duty that we have. Yes. We recognize and uh, we figure that, uh, that there's something wrong with the existing uh, government and that we should be involved in making it a run better and uh, more responsive to the needs of the community. So yeah, so I ran for city council and I was reelected twice and became mayor uh, at that time, and uh, we did some, I thought, some good things, you know. Mm -hmm. As a mayor, I was invited to be part of a delegation uh, that was headed, I was called the Mayors for Peace, it was a delegation to the United Nations that was headed by, uh, by two mayors out of Japan, one from Nagasaki and, uh, and one from Hiroshima, and uh, they put out the invitation to all mayors in the United States and uh, so I heard about it. Somebody asked me if I wanted to go and I said sure. So I wound up going to the United Nations and when I got there I found out that I was the only mayor from the United States that was represented. The entire United States? One mayor. Wow. And that was me. Yeah. And uh, so I met with, govern uh, with governors, with mayors from all over the country, from Cuba, from Latin America, from Africa, from Israel, from Germany, from Spain, from Sweden, from England, you know, from Canada, you know, from Latin America. And uh, so uh, I couldn't understand why I was the only one. You know. but, uh, but anyway, uh, so I got involved with the Mayors for Peace and the, uh, the movement to put an end to nuclear weapons and uh, became a delegate to uh, some conferences in Mexico City, went to a conference in Chile, and uh, so uh, became an activist. And you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a group here locally that's doing some of that work, so I associated myself with them. They're doing great work. Wow. Yeah, so, yeah, so uh, so yeah, uh, as an activist then I became a politician and as a politician there's good things and bad things for one thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, your ego gets pumped, pumped up because yeah. you know, <laughs> as the mayor when you go into a crowded room, every, as soon as the mayor gets there everybody hushes down <laughs> because the mayor is here, you mm -hmm. know, so. And uh, so, uh, so there, that's very, uh, very uh, kind of, egoistic so yeah. to speak you know and uh, so uh, but uh, and sometimes you have to make decisions that uh, either way you go it's not going to work for one portion or another portion of the community so uh, so yeah it's a very challenging position I did eight years and when I came uh, when I finished with that I was uh, selected to be on the Citizens Redistricting Commission mm -hmm. And the Citizens Redistricting Commission follows the census, which happens every 10 years. And the U.S. Constitution says that at least every 10 years that every state must redraw its political districts because of uh, increase in, in population or decrease in population or, or movements around 
uh, around their jurisdiction, in this case, the state of California. So, uh, so myself and 37,000 other people applied to be on this commission and 14 of us were chosen. And out of that, then uh, we started working and we drew, re redrew all the political districts in uh, California, uh, 80 assembly, state assembly districts, 40 senate districts, four board of equalization districts, and 53 uh, congressional districts. So we drew those and as a result of the work that we did, we were recommended for this award from Harvard University and uh, we got the top prize by Harvard University for an innovation, innovative uh, innovations in government and uh, and along with that prize came a hundred thousand dollars and that hundred thousand dollars then we're using to travel around the country to talk about independent citizens redistricting and how you need to take the power of drawing districts away from politicians yeah. and putting them in the hands of citizens mm -hmm. so so currently that's some of the work that I'm doing yeah. you know. in addition to that getting back to the immigrant theme uh, we host uh, immigrant clinics where individuals come and we help them fill out their paperwork and, and we have usually, it's some of us that are community volunteers and then we have lawyers there also. So for the, for the legal aspects of uh, those kinds of applications then uh, we have legal assistance. So, wow. so yeah, I'm, I'm involved with that and a few other things. Yeah, that's so. a, that's mm -hmm. amazing, mm -hmm. wow. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being here. I just have one more question. If you could um, send a message to everybody out there who has an opinion that immigrants are um, taking our jobs or, you know, have this negative effect on our economy, what, what would you say to somebody who had the ignorance of what really is going on? Yeah, well, I would say that, uh, that this country uh, that belongs to all of us, that uh, that uh, that it is uh, that each one of us is a gift to the earth, mm -hmm. and that each one of us are here with a, a basic mission, and that is that mission is to make this a better world. So uh, so we should open up our arms to anybody who's in need, yes. because it might be you tomorrow, right? Yeah. You know, so absolutely. So I would say we need to be compassionate and welcoming of others uh, in the way that we would be welcoming and compassionate with our own families because we're just part of that yeah. larger body. I definitely so, agree. Like yeah. you said before, you know, right. and also the um, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, that was, that came out of the Chicano movement where, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, uh, like, you know, nation states were drawn yes. sometimes arbitrarily, right, by politicians who said, mm -hmm. okay, I want that piece. So they drew this line. And whether that was an isolated community or whether there was a large community that was just being cut up and uh, dissected into various parts, so yeah. so when uh, when that when that line was drawn between the United States and Mexico, then it divided us from our homeland as, yeah. as Mexicanos. And so, yeah, we didn't cross the border; the border crossed us. Definitely. So, thank you so much for oh, being here. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Gavino, for yeah. sharing your story. I am Claire Bear Villegas. Thank you for watching ECTV. Thank you, Claire and Dr. Aguirre. And we'll see you next time on ECTV.